Hello, it's Scott Manley here. While we're huddling down for one of the biggest storms in history, it's time for a, another batch of supporter questions. So this is questions from my supporters over at Patreon. I've tried to collect uh, things from a bunch of different threads, so I'm going to say the new thread is the new place if you're going to post questions to make things easier. But we're going to start with Joshua Savage. Uh, Scott, you're the GOAT. Okay. Um, have you heard anything about steel production before 1945 fetching high costs due to their lack of radiation from nuclear testing? I have. Um, and that, without going to the rest of the question, yes, there was this thing for a long time called low background steel. After the first set of nuclear tests, it released all sorts of stuff into the atmosphere and processing steel requires copious amount of oxygen from the atmosphere so you would end up bringing in dust and debris and therefore any steel made after nuclear uh, tests were going on had a higher background than steel from prior to this. So for a long time, if you were to make a scientific instrument that needed to work with low, with low radiation hardware, you would get it from a special supplier who had sourced it. And one of the places they sourced this stuff was from World War II ships that had been scuttled after the war. There was a whole bunch in Scapa Flow, a former like a German Navy. Um, other places they would find like old rail cars as well was another source that was slightly easier to get to. But now, since they stopped atmospheric testing in the 1960s, the radiation level has actually dropped off enough that I believe, except in maybe extreme circumstances, generally you don't need to worry about low radiation steel for most hardware, but I could be wrong on that. Okay, Daryl Ball, I've had an idea for a rocket engine based on a variation of Vasimir ion drive. If nitrogen were used as the reaction mass in the engine, then after being accelerated, the grid of nitrogen ions were neutralized and allowed to recombine into N2. Wouldn't that chemical reaction add enough energy to the plasma to bring it close to Epstein drive levels of efficiency? Well, no, not Epstein drive levels of efficiency because that is an atomic process and Epstein drive requires fusion levels of energy, like there's a huge gulf in the amount of energy between them. But, so so here's the thing, Vasimir, I believe, uses a magnetic nozzle, right? It's guiding the stuff through, it heats it up in a chamber, confines it magnetically, and then it blows out through this nozzle. Now, if you neutralize the nitrogen, then you're releasing energy, but at that point, it's not able to be contained by the nozzle, right? If you're recombining it, it's no longer ionized. So I would say, I don't see how this would work, um, but the energy released would still be modest. Um, there might be other ways to do things. Like, you know, on paper, <laughs> if you could have purely ionized hydrogen and then have that recombine with electrons, that would make an even hotter plasma than uh, just you're burning hydrogen with oxygen. So, you know, they've talked about, this is like some ridiculous idea that was like, if you could just have a tank of pure hydrogen ions and a tank of electrons, it doesn't quite work like that. Anyway, um, so we're going to say probably not, but actually you never know. Maybe there's some way this could work. Daniel Brownson, a long time viewer, new Patreon, have a couple of questions about space rockets and such. Just how toxic is rocket grade hydrogen peroxide? both in comparison to the more common hypergolic oxidizers and also the hydrogen peroxide you might find in the store. Okay, well, hydrogen peroxide is, uh, it's actually not that toxic, right? But it is corrosive and it will bleach your skin very quickly if you have high test peroxide. Now, the stuff that you get in stores is like 3% typically. Um, you might get higher concentrations, but this, what's called high test peroxide is up about 95%. You can't get much higher than that, I believe, because it just wants to break down into water and oxygen. And that affects the storability. You have to be very careful about cleaning down and passivating everything that the hydrogen peroxide touches or it will bubble. And then if you haven't got it perfectly pure, impurities will cause it to slowly decompose over time. And the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide is one of the main reasons why the Soyuz uh, spacecraft can't remain in orbit for more than about six months because that hydrogen peroxide that is required for the landing hardware, like, so 
Soyuz has three sections and the service module primary propulsion is hypergolic using your UDMH and uh, NTO. But the descent module has people inside it and for its landing, it has hydrogen peroxide as its propellant because that's safer and, you know, it's much safer. So he asked, yeah, does, you know, how does this compare to other hypergolic fuels? And there's no contest. Uh, nitrogen tetroxide, that stuff gets into the air, it creates acids, which are just really, really nasty. Um, hydrazine and its derivatives are, you know, neurotoxins and they will also give you cancer. So, um, Hydrogen peroxide is a lot better, but the performance isn't that great. And the downside, and of course, it just is very hard to remain stable. So it's not used for many things. Um, now, there's another question here from Paul Brundit and Daniel Broman Brownson also asked, you know, why, why have we seen more vehicles with kerosene and hydrogen peroxide? And Paul Brundit asked, would the Black Arrow ever be likely to turn into a viable launch vehicle? And the uh, Black Arrow is the British launch vehicle that use kerosene and liquid oxygen. Uh, sorry, yeah, kerosene and hydrogen peroxide as its propulsion. And look, the the Black Arrow would have been a perfectly viable launch vehicle because it would have worked out to be cheaper than what the US ultimately started trying to sell the UK. You know, the US, part of the reason why Black Arrow was cancelled was because the US said, hey, look, we'll launch your satellites for this price. And so after Britain cancelled the Black Arrow, suddenly the price went up. Like, <laughs> of course it was going to happen. What did you think? I mean, obviously, kerosene and hydrogen peroxide is a viable propellant because um, Skyrora are planning to use that for their vehicle. So it, it clearly has its fans and therefore they, they think they can you know, work with this in a commercial environment. But you know, having a country having its own launch vehicle is valuable in many, many ways. And uh, I think that was a big step backwards. Okay, James Cahill or Cohill, I don't know, maybe misspelled this. <laughs> yeah, of course you didn't misspell your own name. There are some videos on YouTube that were taken inside a Saturn V tank during flight. The minute the fuel goes zero G, it's everywhere. How do you relight the engine under those conditions the way they obviously do? Well, first of all, I think those uh, those actual uh, films were taken inside the oxygen tank, which is a propellant tank. So I'm presuming when you say fuel, you meant propellant. But yeah, when you shut down the engine, everything floats around. And what you want is when you light your engine for the propellant to be sitting at the bottom of the tank. So to do this, you need ullage thrusters. And the Saturn V had this uh, between each stages there would be stage separation motors that would push down and another set of stage separation motors that would push up to make sure that the propellant remained at the bottom of the tank. Now, this was even more important in the third stage, which is, oh God, it's really hard to do this in a mirror. Ah, it's there. God, right, this third stage. Oh dear, it's complicated things I try to do for you people. Um, because it had to go into orbit, it had to la add the last one kilometer per second of orbital velocity. And then after getting to the right location, it had to fire its engine again to go to the moon. So they had to have ullage thrusters that would you know, push them and settle the propellant. Uh, you'll hear in a lot of the maneuvering around the moon in the astronauts, you'll hear about ullage burns. And that was done with the reaction control thrusters, which had a much smaller propellant supply. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways of doing this, but it's it's critical to managing your propellant. Um, a lot of a lot of fuel tanks in zero G, they are designed with a bladder inside them so that you pressurize the exterior of the bladder and it squeezes the propellant out like a fuel, like a toothpaste, right? So that's another way of dealing with thrusters rather than having to settle. Obviously, if you're going to settle thrusters, you need a thruster that works. And so that's one way of doing it. Okay. Random question from Alex Thomas. Why doesn't SpaceX develop a Methalox second stage for Falcon 9 using the Raptor vacuum engine? Granted, the nozzle would be large, but from what I can calculate, it would work. It would absolutely work on paper. You could put a slightly more efficient second stage on there and perhaps, um, yeah, yeah, you could definitely do that. What I would say though, is that between the Raptor vacuum second stage, and uh, the propellant being lower density and now being able to carry a bit more of it because you've got a more efficient end. I, I think what that does ultimately is it stretches that second stage. And one of the things that 
was... I, I'm not saying that people uh, say it's a bad thing, but there's definitely... The Falcon 9 is one of the tallest and skinniest rockets. This is the fineness ratio, the ratio between the height and the length. And when you start getting rockets that get very long and thin, they, they do actually start to suffer from new types of stability issues related to flexing. So anyway, yeah, they could in theory do this, but it's not clear that there's any payloads that would gain them anything. If they need any more power from a Falcon 9, they have the Falcon Heavy. What, in fact, is the bottleneck on the Falcon 9 frequently is the fairing size, and that is being solved in the uh, in the near future. They're going to have a longer fairing available. Uh, okay, Jörg Wiener, uh, Wim Wimmer. But here's a question from my eight-year-old son, Dorian, who which I couldn't answer. Why are all heat shields black? I assume a more reflective surface wouldn't wouldn't help much with heat, that mainly due to air compression and friction. But why are they never painted better to match the hull of the ship? Um, they are actually. <laughs> if you look at one example, is the Orion capsule that was demoed on the Delta IV. Seems like an eternity ago that we had an SLS related test. Yeah, it was a. Uh, it was silvered. It was reflective because this capsule was going to be flying in space without a service module and it, they needed it for thermal control. A lot of the times though, you can't actually see the heat shield on the spacecraft because it's hidden underneath uh, a service module behind it. Uh, and now the natural color of the phenolic resin that they use is like, it's like a yellow color and you'll see this in the Avcoat um, heat shields that were used on Apollo and they are also going to be used on Orion. I'm not sure what they use on Starliner, but I'm pretty sure it's the same thing. It's, it'll be this yellow reddish thing. Now, if they paint it, then it's hidden underneath the service module. You're adding extra mass. The only way you would reason you would put a cover on that or color on it would be if you were trying to get some uh, thermal control in flight if it wasn't hidden. So I think a lot of these are just left their natural color. And then when they hit the atmosphere, they naturally turn black due to the incredible heating. Of course, Starship, or originally they talked about using um, using a cooling system, using the, the percolation, what do you call it? <laughs> Transpiration cooling, where you would have, you know, you'd be blowing your methane through that and protecting the surface of the stainless steel. And that would have meant that the stainless steel was shiny and reflective. And that would actually make a lot of sense when you're re-entering at speeds of, like escape velocity speeds, where you're falling back from the moon much faster than returning from just simple low earth orbit. Because when you're up at the very high end, the heat transfer turns from being driven by convection, which is you know hot plasma moving through the stagnation zone and uh, ultimately touching the surface, to like, radiation where the stagnation zone gets so hot it's like a giant heat lamp shooting onto the surface. So there's this like point at which having a reflective heat shield apparently starts to make sense early on, although when you, once you slow down convection again starts to dominate. So that is something I've heard uh, but haven't seen any spacecraft doing that. Um, David Stevens. If today we discovered an asteroid that was on a certain collision course with the Earth, how much lead time do you think we would need to pool all our world's resources together to save the Earth? A year? Ten years? I'm pretty sure a few months warning would be hopeless. Look, I, I'm saying decades, right? Multiple decades, very likely. Uh, like, I, I mean, th when you've got something that's very, very close, the best you can hope for is mitigation, right? Figuring out where it's land and, and try to evacuate and harden whatever systems are necessary. Depends on the size of the object as well. Bigger things are going to need more time. But I also pointed out in my video about keyholes that the best time to direct to redirect an asteroid is just before it undergoes a close gravitational encounter with a planet. Because that then messes up the trajectory afterwards. So the problem is you may not be able to accurately predict an impact with the Earth until after it's gone through its final keyhole attempt. So that makes things slightly harder um, because, you know, your last, the first time you're sure that it's going to hit will be the moment when you've missed your opportunity to direct, redirect it. Uh, the best way, of course, to fix this is to be looking really hard and getting really good, you know, scientific astrometry data on these things so you can accurately predict their orbits 
for longer term. Um, okay, Drew Granston. Could a rocket be launched through the eye of a hurricane? Yes. I mean, the only problem with that eye of a hurricane is you have very limited time to get ready and you pretty much have to have had the hurricane come over. So you would be in locked out, locked, secured everything, and then quick, the hurry, eye of the hurricane's here. Let's move the launch pad up, pop the thing vertical, whatever, make sure it's fueled, ready to go, launch. Sure, it's possible. Like, there's no... There's no, nothing stopping it launching from inside the hurricane, but other than the fact that they usually take hours, if not days, of preparation to set up and launch. Finally, uh, I have this block of questions from Katarina Newart, uh, Newgart, whatever. Um, Hi, Scott. How was your day today? It was very wet. Hope you're doing fine. I'm still alive. If no one's going to ask, I have a few normie questions. Great. What's your favorite color? Indigo. Um, do you have a favorite number and why? 1729, because it's Bender's serial number from Futurama, but more importantly, it's the Ranamanjan Hardy number. Go and look it up. It's also a Carmichael number and all sorts of other cool stuff. Are you planning on Google uh, goofing around in Kerbal Space Program? We're doing Runway Project Season 4, so probably. Um, what equipment do I use for DJing and do I still do it? Use it? Um, do it. I still have um, PDX D3S turntables from Vestax, which I bought 20 years ago. I bought them because they were higher torque, they had a reverse option, and they had a straight tone arm, which made the needle tracking better for, you know, uh, turntable manipulation. Albeit, the downside is the sound quality is not as good as the SL1200, but, you know, that's that's your gig. I uh, use spherical needles and uh, they're Ortofon cartridges, I believe. The mixer, uh, depending on what I'm doing, I've got a Newmark scratch mixer with an optical crossfader, which I did a lot of work on. But generally these days I use the uh, similar Newmark, same uh, shape, but it has a chaos pad effect unit in it. And... Uh, that is fun because you can do all sorts of effects. And yeah, I don't really do it anymore, but I still have lots of fun records and I still love listening to everything. It's amazing. Um, finally, uh, what does my filming setup look like? Well, um, I don't have a filming setup because I use digital recording. So yeah, filming setup. First of all, this is currently an iPhone. Frequently, I will use this uh, Sony RX7 Mark... Uh, no, wait, RX10? RX100 Mark 7, that's what it is, which is a fantastic little point and shoot camera. But, you know, um, for some reason, I just keep on putting things out on the um, on the phone. And yeah, let's actually take the phone out and we'll show you the rest of it. So, yes, obviously, you know, my backdrop. Lots to see there. Uh, there's a cupboard where I push everything. Flip things around and you can actually see the ring light that I use for most of my stuff and the laptop with the questions I have carefully picked out because it's actually getting hard to find questions. Up there there's a bunch of garbage, um, although there's a really cool little, uh, you know, there's a now planning Mars Exploration Rover uh, sign which actually came from the MER campaign. Yeah my uh, YouTube stuff. This is the desktop where I do most of my video editing and I do most of my editing using Vegas. Um, haven't quite switched. I should really switch over to Final Cut, but um, yeah, Vegas still is what I know very well and what I use. And yeah, that's all surrounded by, you know, gear, electronics. Um, I got this 3D printer. I've run out of space for my, uh, <laughs> my ISS model. It's currently sitting on the platter of my 3D printer, which I really need to use. Yeah, um, that's the space that I have. So thanks for those questions. I hope I get more questions because actually I'm running short. Please add them to the new thread. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.